Okay, so um, welcome to everybody who is joining now our first webinar of the governance program at the Aga Khan University Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations dialogue series for 2021 to 2022. Um, I know some of you are joining and slowly the numbers of attendees will be joining in. So I hope everyone will know why they're here and are looking forward to the session that we'll be having today. The series that we're hosting in the governance program this year for 2021 to 2022 is looking at population surveillance, the body and mobility. And this is the first of our series and the first of our lectures that will be taking place through uh, much of the winter term of 2021 to 2022. The series itself is examining the 21st century population mobility um, surveillance with a focus on ID cards, passports, checkpoint and policing, um, particularly in the global south, but also spaces of interaction and intersection with the global north. And the series has been um, chosen in part because of the significance and the growing significance in the ways in which governance is affecting um, and shaped by greater controls and regulations over the body in the 21st century, much of which has been shaped by, of course, the era of the global war on terror, by a growing focus on migration practices and bordering practices, as well as, as, well as of course, um, in more recent times, the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic but also this wider issue around global health. But part of the series is also, of course, trying to make out the linkages and make out the connections between the past playing out in the present, or indeed very much colonial presence, and how they also affect and shaped governance practices and also practices of surveillance. Much of what we want to try and do in this series is really looking at how technologies and digitalization are affecting and transforming governance policies, particularly when it comes around to this notion of managing the body and having control over the body that states, governments, and sometimes non-governmental organizations and other actors try to enforce. And part of what we're trying to do is to unpick and understand how forms of population surveillance today are affecting societies and populations across the world, but with a particular focus, of course, for um, the Aga Khan University with uh, a centering on Muslim societies and, and Muslim spaces. Part of what we'll be doing in the series over this um, winter term, we'll be having online discussions with um, scholars and academics, uh, scholars, academics, journalists, activists, and others who are um, analyzing these, um, these issues. And part of what we'll also be doing is um, bringing together written contributions from these very persons and having these produced into an on, uh, onto a publication that will be made available online and in print form as well. So I'd like to welcome you to the very first uh, if event of this uh, series, Digitalizing Borders, where we have two wonderful scholars who I'm very, very honored to have presenting and speaking about their works with us today in an in-conversational style. Um, we have first, um, Polly Pallister Wilkins, who is an associate professor in the Department of Politics at the University of Amsterdam. Welcome, Polly. Um, she's a political scientist, um, a political geographer, and with a research focus on humanitarian responses to border violence and mobility injustice. She's the author of the forthcoming work, Humanitarian Borders, with Verso, as well as a number of articles that examine what Polly refers to as humanitarian border work with a specific focus on the Mediterranean and Greek hotspots. Her current research is looking and concerned with what black radical and especially feminist traditions and indigenous knowledges can offer us for um, decolonizing humanitarianism. So I'm really excited to have Polly here with us, particularly because of your work um, in recent years on European migration and around the Mediterranean and how it ties into, of course, what is known as the so-called refugee crisis um, in, in Europe. But also, of course, you've done also very interesting work on borders and checkpoints and, and so borders and fences um, in Palestine, Israel and other spaces as well. So welcome, Polly. And um, of course, we're also joined by uh, the wonderful Helga Tawalsuri, who is is somebody who, of course, has influenced um, 
both Polly and also myself in our own works and writings. And um, Helga Taulasuri is a media scholar whose work focuses on the overlaps between spatiality, technology and politics with a particular focus on Palestine, Israel. Helga is an associate professor in the Department of Media, Culture and Communication, uh, Communication at the Department of Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies at New York University. And we're really grateful and um, honored that you are joining us here today. And we're really looking forward to discussing your work, discussing your work on Palestine, Israel, particularly with the focus on uh, digital technologies and surveillance. And allow me to introduce myself. Um, my name is Sana Alimia. I'm an assistant professor of political science at the Aga Khan University Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations. So today's session then centers on digitalizing borders and it's bringing together a conversation really between Helga and Polly, um, whose work on space technology and mobility pushes us to examine the unequal, violent and racialized nature of borders today. And both of your works have been really important in trying to examine and really pushing us to see the ways in which technological shifts themselves are challenging some mainstream myths that we have when it comes to understanding borders and understanding terms such as globalization and migration and mobility. And so I'd like to thank both of you for, for joining us um, all here today. And I'll just let everyone in the audience know what the format of the session will be. It will be really an in conversation and I will be moderating some of the um, questions and we'll be having a conversation between um, Polly and Helga and their respective works. And I'll kind of tease out some, uh, some questions in the first instance and both of the scholars will be speaking to each other about their work as well. So this won't be a lecture format for 10 minutes and another lecture for 10 minutes. It will be an in conversation between these two scholars. And then we would like to invite the audience members as well to have any questions uh, that they would like to ask these two scholars and put them into the chat box. And I will pick up on those questions and hopefully draw them out in the conversations as well, or in a, um, if, depending on the time, if we have uh, more of a space for specifically just a Q&A from the audience as well. So I hope that sounds, uh, sounds good. And I'll start off perhaps then with the first set of questions for, for both of you. And, um, you know, it's just a teaser and opening question so that we can get the, the ice broken a little bit and hear from you both about your works. And it's really to um, just to get us to, you know, because you have the pressure and the honor of opening up the series for us. And I'm going to, of course, ask this question of the elephant in the room when it comes to population surveillance um, and mobility in the 21st century is speaking about borders. And of course, today we're talking about digitalizing borders. And so the first point that I want to open up to both of you is how do we conceptualize the border today? Because we have you know, borders everywhere in the news, constantly being uh, sp sp spoken about, particularly with the pandemic, but also with refugee mobilities um, and crises as they're referred to. And of course, um, Polly, I know in your work, you refer to the ways in which scholarship has really pushed recently to decenter the border and you speak yourself about borderscapes. And meanwhile, Helga, in your own work, you show the ways in which media infrastructures and networks are not themselves boundless um, and open, but function as politically defined territorial spaces of control are in, and are integral spaces of territorial reality. So you, of course, push us to understand and imagine how you know, concepts that we have around how, you know, the fluidity of borders can also be shaped and somehow confined and shaped by borders. So I'm going to open up the questions to both of you and you can uh, jump in whoever wants to go first is how do we understand the border today? And is there one way to imagine it? Um, and how is it kind of being challenged and changing these mainstream myths that we've become so, so accustomed to? I'm going to go with Polly because I can see you <laughs> moving. Okay, I'll go first. And I just want to say thank you very, very much for this uh, opportunity and this invitation. Um, it's a real honor to, to be in conversation um, with, with you, Sana, and, and with Helga. I'm, I'm a massive fan of Helga's work and have been so for a long time. Um, and her work has really sort of shaped a lot of my thinking um, on these issues. So it's really, really great that we can uh, have this conversation today. Um, so yeah, so what is the border? Well, 
<laughs> How long do we have? I mean, this is a this is a million dollar question. Um, but I think I mean I think we can say that uh, the academic work within within political geography within critical border studies, I mean at this point in time has moved us way beyond and well beyond the idea that you know the border is is a line on the map. Um, not to say that those lines are not important, um, they are, um, but that you know we can understand borders as sort of as multiple as occurring in multiple sites, multiple spaces, you know, way beyond um, the borderline internally within um, sovereign territory and of course externally outside uh, of sovereign territory. It was a very popular um, refrain in, in the sort of the mid 2000s that the border was everywhere. Um, but of course that sort of, I mean, that's an interesting and an important uh, intervention to make, but at the same time, it's not necessarily analytically very helpful um, because of course the border may be everywhere, um, but of course it operates and it's performed and it's structured um, in different ways, in different places. Um, it is made possible by different types of work, be that through you know digital technologies, be that through the sort of the everyday work of people formally charged with governing the border, such as border police, but also through particular state and, and non-state bureaucracies. And um, also very importantly, of course, how people themselves experience um, the border um, is of course dependent on people's racialization, people's class position, people's relative uh, privilege. Um, within a world where you know borders mean very very different things to very very di you know to different people, um, so I could talk about this forever, but <laughs> and I'll probably come back to some of these issues. But I'll I'll stop now and I'll let Helga jump in. Hey, thanks, Polly. But also, let me just sort of take a minute to thank you, Sana, and Polly, and everybody else uh, for the invitation. I'm also very honored to be here and sort of. Uh, I guess I, I didn't realize until now that we are launching this. So I guess that million dollar question in terms of how much time we have to answer that question is going to be your long answer, right? Um, but I think it's a great question to sort of even think about well, what does a border mean today? Because as Polly kind of makes clear is, you know, we do seem to be living in this moment where there's this sort of proliferation and multiplicity of borders. Um, uh, but I think what's kind of also interesting to me is thinking about how um, increasingly something called a border can, can exist in these spaces or in, in these sites where we wouldn't really expect them to be anymore, right? Or maybe we do expect them to be now, but certainly not previously. And so borders can, in, in a sense, can be very material things, but they're increasingly also very ephemeral or digital or abstract or invisible or presumably so. Um, and so I think what's interesting to ask is like, you know, what are the, or we do still live in this sort of very contradictory moment, which is what makes it interesting to talk about borders. And that moment is on the one hand, we do presumably live in this sort of more open or as for some people shrinking world, right? Where it is defined by the constant flow and movement of people, of things, of money, of all sorts of things. But yet simultaneously this world that really kind of curtails various sorts of flows and movements. And I think the interesting question is, you know, so who, what, where, and why, and under what conditions are certain things and people allowed to move and who, what, where, when, how, why, uh, and under which conditions are others not. Um, and so part of the question becomes is, is, you know, what are the techniques, if I can call them that, that enable these kind of differentiated, um, I guess, sort of constrictions and permeabilities, right? I still think, though, that there is a value in thinking about the, the sort of older, perhaps more mainstream, kind of more geopolitical sense of thinking about a border, right? And that a border does demarcate a space. It does demarcate where one form of sovereignty or control exists uh, or where it ends and where another one begins. I think it's also a way of understanding uh, 
the means of regulating control or, or the means of regulating or controlling different movements and flows. So that very much, I think, still draws from the sort of these old ideas of, of you know, the border between, I don't know, US and Mexico or France and Germany or whatever. Um, but uh, even if, even if we're talking about borders as shifting uh, sites and borders as somehow changing their almost like their nature, I think structurally perhaps they, they still do similar things. So maybe that would be my, but yeah, it's a never ending kind of. Yeah, thank you both as well for that opening because it's yeah, it's the the ubiquitous border has been somewhat kind of, you know, it's, it's interesting to see the significance of it at the same time. And the notion of space has been quite an important kind of continued uh, presence, if you will. Um, and I wanted to perhaps ask then on to, for both of you to speak a little bit more about your own respective works when it comes down to understanding borders and mobility and the geographies in which you work and the role of technology in these spaces. Um, because across both of your bodies of work and you know such substantial scholarship that both of you have, um, when it comes down to these issues of mobility and population surveillance and borders, what's always striking is that both of you uncover in quite powerful ways, the ways in which inequalities are maintained and upheld through um, technologies that try to gather control over the body. And what I would like to perhaps um, ask both of you to do um, is just to give an example of this um, through your own work so that our audience can get to know a little bit more about your own work if they're not familiar with, uh, with your works themselves. So perhaps if I can ask both of you to just to think about across your bodies of work, the ways in which you uncover how inequalities are maintained and managed through technologies and perhaps draw out one or two examples that you'd like to, to draw up, to bring to light for our audience. Um, and perhaps this time I will ask um, Helga <laughs> to start off and then I'll come to Polly. Sure. Um, so I guess maybe first I will say that even though I recognize that this is a panel about the digitalization of borders, when I think of technology, I, I think of everything from concrete to databases, right? From razor wires to, oh, I don't know, the electromagnetic spectrum from computers to ID cards, right? So to me, all of these are different technologies. And so sometimes trying to mark this, this difference of new versus old or digital versus analog, while sometimes helpful, in some cases, uh, I think that it's important to think of the continuities that sort of exist between these. So. In my own work, I, which perhaps is a way of justifying the things that I look at, but you know, I'm on the one hand obsessed with checkpoints, and I think it's pretty easy to understand why a checkpoint might function as a border, right? It's a means to control or hinder or or allow a kind of movement between one place or another, and it's this physical thing that we see and that we touch, and it's obviously sort of very territorial, right? It may not be a huge conceptual leap to say, oh well, the next thing that I that I sort of tend to think about are things like ID cards or passports, um, but that these operate as borders too. Um, they are technologies which, which we are increasingly required to have in order to move across these certain spaces, right? And they become necessary to have access, whether to space or to citizenship or to rights or to inclusions of different kinds. And so here it, it's, it's almost like, well, the border becomes not just simply a space, but this kind of marking of territory, but all, or a marking of territory, but it also becomes this means of checking, of, I don't know, of capturing, of, of qualifying, of quantifying, or categorizing, in a sense, almost like of creating certain kinds of people or profiles or so on, right? Um, and I guess perhaps if you want on the other end is I think of mobile phones uh, as an example of something that can also kind of function as a border, odd as that might sound, because already the term itself suggests otherwise, right? It's like this device that enables us to communicate while we move around. So presumably this is like borderless, right? Um, but I think on, I tend to look at 
um, I tend to look at mobile phones maybe a little bit differently in that um, a mobile phone, first of all, needs a whole kind of slew of systems and things that are very much fixed in space in order for it to work, right? So anything from like the wires and the cables and the software codes and the machines and so on, that those are very determining factors that I think um, uh, sort of speak to notions of borders. On the other kind of more ephemeral level, which I think I'd mentioned earlier, is that, you know, Mobile phones work by using signals that travel on the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, nobody owns the spectrum, right? Nobody can touch it in a, in a certain way, but yet it is something that, you know, we as in society, different policies, different states, whatever kind of decide to sort of uh, section off, right? That you can allow, you are allowed to use this and you're allowed to use that. And so how a state decides, for example, how to, how to license the spectrum becomes itself this, this sort of possibly confining um, mode of control. So, and, in certain places, like, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know what, uh, so that, or Polly, what you use, I don't know, Vodafone or BT or whatever it is, right? For, for, for that, or here it'd be like, I don't know, AT&T and Verizon. It's, we take it for granted that it doesn't matter what service we have or what phone we use or what provider we have, that somehow we're just gonna be able to connect. But you look at the case of Israel-Palestine and that's really actually not the case, right? So it really does matter. Um, which the you know which provider you're using and whether that provider happens to be Israeli or Palestinian and where you are in a physical space and whether or not you're even going to have a signal. So even something as presumably open and mobile as a mobile phone, um, I think if you kind of whatever uncover or sort of dig behind, you'll kind of recognize it also functions in this very similar, often territorial, but in this kind of bordering way, right? Of, who's allowed certain mobilities and certain freedoms and who's not and where and how. So maybe that was too long, sorry. No, that's great. And I'm gonna actually jump in because we have, I mean, so the audience members are welcome to kind of drop in questions. I'm not gonna be able to see all of them, but there are a couple that will be quite interesting. And I think that Rahil M. Lakhani has kind of asked an interesting one just on your point, M. Helga, about your research, which is really fascinating, particularly when you're looking at mobile phones and, and the infrastructure that goes behind them, the technologies. So his question is really, how do you go about doing the research as a researcher and a scholar? So I guess he's kind of interested in what does it mean for you as a, as a, as a researcher when you're going out to examine these? What are the types of things that you do? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. It's something maybe that we don't often talk about, right? I mean, I think academics do a lot of reading and a lot of interviewing and, and stuff like that. In my case, I've spent, it's almost embarrassing to say, but I've spent an inordinate amount of time sort of just moving around with different cell phones that I've had to purchase that belong to different providers and just simply test like, okay, is there signal here or is there not? Is there signal here or is there not? And do I get an Israeli signal in which company or do I get a Palestinian one in which company? So it is, in, in my case, I think there is this kind of very, I don't know, physical bodily uh, sense of, you know, it's, I mean, you can't call it territorial ethnography because it doesn't make any sense, but that's sort of a little bit of what I do, as well as, you know, look up, um, there's a lot of talking to engineering uh, people, right? I mean, I've had to learn a lot about, I don't know, all sorts of things that I can't even uh, verbalize. Um, but, you know, I've had to understand how this, how cell phones work and how they're structured and how signals travel and what the electromagnetic spectrum is and so on. So I think it's, it's a sort of, it's this huge combination of things, some of which are kind of fun, like just sort of standing around looking for cell phone signals. Um, and some of which are actually much harder, right? Which is like, okay, I want to interview somebody at a particular firm about, or at a particular uh, government entity about where are the Palestinians allowed to build their cell phone towers and where, where are they not? Those are more often more difficult to get to, but there's always means of sort of finding the proper maps and the policies and so on. Great. Thank you so much. That's really fascinating. And I just, I, yeah, it's a, and it's a really amazing way to do kind of field research as well, right? This uh, uh, figuring out the, where, the, where the cell phone signals are and what country welcomes you as well on your, on your, on your server, right? Um, when you're in these spaces. Um, and um, so Polly, I'm going to come to you as well then, I guess, on these, uh, just to, for you to introduce us a bit more to your work and the unequal uh, ways and unequal experiences that are sometimes maintained by technologies. 
Oh, that, I just listening to Helga, I had I had memories of you know the multiple SIM cards I had when I was doing my PhD uh, field work in the West Bank. You know, yeah, my Israeli SIM card, my Palestinian SIM card, but also you know the issues of doing doing uh, field work on the Greek Turkish border and whether or not you're you're actually in the EU, so you're not paying roaming charges, or you're actually getting a Turkish signal and and paying roaming charges and the the terror of your phone bill um, <laughs> are following that. Um, but I was really really um, happy. That Helga also mentioned that that uh, the sort of what I call the the non digital or the material or the analog um, technologies of of bordering because it's something that I I, I mean I've worked um, on the intersection of the material and and the digital with my work on um, uh, security barriers walls fences and 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 their role in sort of data capturing. Um, but I also wanted to talk in the examples that, that uh, you asked us to, to sort of think about. I also wanted to talk about a, a technology that is not digital. And I thought what I could talk about in this way and to sort of think about how technologies manage, make possible, perform, reproduce particular inequalities or particular unequal geographies. I wanted to actually sort of mention the work I did on personal protective equipment. Um, and, in, and its role in the Ebola crisis in managing and sort of mediating and making possible um, individual patient care um, at the level of, of the individual, but also in, in governing global biosecurity, right? And sort of governing pandemic response um, and, and global health. Um, but the types of inequalities in global health, in public health provision in, in West Africa, um, that PPE made visible or who had access to PPE made visible. So, you know, international humanitarian organizations, not local healthcare workers um, within Ebola affected regions, um, how, how sort of PPE um, made those more visible, but also how access to PPE entrenched or re-entrenched those particular um, inequalities. Um, but you know, the way in which I got interested in personal protective equipment was very much the way in which it sort of worked as a sort of selectively permeable barrier, um, similar to the way and, and the work I'd done previously on borders and, and security barriers, but a sort of a security barrier that was selectively permeable that, permeable, that facilitated life and governed risk, but something that was that was worn on the body. And then I had a, another thought um, and Helga's movement to discuss mobile phones uh, was very helpful as an in on this because I was then thinking about, and this is very current to our, to our, to today, to our experiences right now, um, and that is of course COVID passports, right? The COVID apps, the COVID passports, the QR codes that we're being asked to generate, um, and the ways in which you know these are. <laughs> the technology, the digital technology on which these COVID passports rely, of course, assume a whole host of things, right? It assumes somebody has access to a smartphone in the first place, right? It sort of it re-inscribes or re re-performs the border as a sort of sort of socio-technical device because it also relies on people being regularized, right? Access to the vaccine in the first place, access um, to the to the forms of identification that become linked to your COVID passport, are sort of you know ways of re-inscribing the border, processes of inclusion and exclusion are, are sort of written in and re-performed through these COVID passports. And of course, they are actually, you know, even even in our supposedly open European Union, they are increasingly also linked to state territories, right? So there is a European Union-wide COVID passport, but you know some individual uh, European states have decided to have their own um, COVID passports. Um, the Netherlands being one of them, and this leads to to huge problems of sort of interoperability um, across across the sort of the management of public health, even within um, the context of the of the EU. And of course, actually, these digital technologies, um, you know, as Helga was saying, work to kind of reproduce state territoriality. And of course, they also work to reinscribe global inequalities in, in immobility and in access. And then the way that vaccines being able to show you've been vaccinated um, enables you to, to, to access global levels of mobility because of course we are increasingly seeing the ways in which certain global north states are not only limiting access to the vaccine um, by not going for a trips waiver 
but are also saying that they are not going to recognize um, the sort of all, you know, various forms of, of COVID passports for, from the global south, from the majority world. So I sort of also wanted to sort of think about the ways in which these are still very important, very pressing questions um, that are you know, hot topics right now. Um, and I think are affecting all of our lives and they're affecting the lives of some of my students who are coming who are from the UK and can't get their NHS QR code recognized when they need to go into it or they want to go into a bar uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and you know, Adam, <laughs> that's a, maybe a luxury problem, maybe a first world problem, um, but it's also, of course, reinscribing already very restrictive um, border control policies that manage um, the global south and, and sort of maintain global mobility and justice. I'll stop there. I could rant about this all day, so I'll, I'll just stop there. Yeah, I mean, and I, I think, can I jump in real quick? Yeah. Um, I was just gonna say, that's a, I think COVID passports is an amazing example, right? Because it's something that everybody can kind of relate to no matter what you believe or whether you, you live in a place where, it, where one is enforced or not, because it actually shows how a border is something that kind of moves, right? And it's something that's dynamically kind of redefined and, and that it's practiced and spread in these sort of very uneven ways. But the other thing that, that I think of when I think of, of COVID passports, and this is a factor of perhaps living in, you know, I don't know, the center of capitalist empire, right? Is that here in the US, what you have is you have these different apps and these different providers that ultimately make money off of the fact that you have to use this COVID passport as opposed to that COVID passport, right? So do you use the New York City one or the New York State one or the one that, that you know, whatever. So there's so many different choices, if you will, that these are also sometimes very often kind of means of huge profit making, not for the individuals, right? But whether uh, in some cases for states, in some cases for the military, in some cases for these sort of large tech corporations. So when I think of of, of, of the way of how borders kind of multiply and often do become these sort of more digitized things or processes. I, I also think about how um, these are often very economic uh, questions or have these very sort of economic implications to them. Yeah, definitely. I think everyone who's kind of having to you know, you need to have a phone to be able to also get into this kind of, you know, to be able to be, as Polly says, you need to be regularized. And of course, for an entire generation, even within the global north of, you know, senior people who may not be so familiar with technologies, and some are perfectly fine with it, but then there's that entire kind of like spectrum of people that may be left out of the discussion. And then, of course, I think, Polly, the point of regularization you know, for those who are not documented or for those who don't understand the migration systems, you know, and its complications and have complicated kind of scenarios, what do you do in that situation? In fact, it seems that, you know, this uh, greater reliance on digital technologies and surveillance just kind of further marginalizes and puts people in greater spaces of risk, if you will. Um, we have, I'm going to, so I'm, you know, I will always welcome the audience to kind of feed in questions and, and if they kind of link into the conversation, I think I'm not going to wait to the end, I'll just feed them in throughout the discussion because I have a feeling we're going to weave through some quite interesting topics, so it's quite nice to have the audience with us. And we have a question from uh, David Abraham, who's said, of course, reflecting that you know, in this age of the panopticon of surveillance and control, on the flip side, there seems to be from the bottom up a, um, you know, a culture of exhibitionism, if you will, from, you know, whatever it is, from social media to, to all of these other, you know, forms that seem to be part and parcel of life. So the question that he's um, posing is that, are we as a society, I guess, reflecting control that is coming from above or are we feeding it? Um, you know, so I don't know how, what, what both of you think of, of that, of the role of the state, state versus society in, in control in, in the surveillance age. I don't know if I can answer that, but I can certainly talk about the role of social media in as a bordering, a digital bordering technology um, and the way in which social media um, is increasingly used and people's social media profiles are increasingly used, for example, in um, determining whether somebody um, has access to asylum, right? And, you know, the photos that people post 
the SIM cards they have in their in their in their mobile phones. I mean, there was a, a well-known problem, for example, of Afghan refugees in, in Greece um, being denied um, asylum in Greece because they have Pakistani mobile SIM cards because they're actually Afghan refugees from Pakistan who have, of course, lost their ability to stay in Pakistan, cannot stay in Afghanistan, come to, come to Greece. Um, and of course, because they have pa Pakistani SIM cards, they are thought to be Pakistani. Right, they're assumed to be Pakistani and therefore not considered to be um, as at risk um, as they would be considered to be um, if they were if they were um, Afghani, but or Afghan. Um, but you know, and in terms of sort of social media, um, you know, it is it is increasingly used as a as a form as a way of determining whether somebody is is a legitimate refugee, um, whether the stories they are telling are seen to be to be um, believed. Um, so I think, you know, in that sense, it's important to sort of understand um, the way it works in that way. But in the, in the flip side, it's also worked in ways and it worked in ways very, especially in 2015, when we saw large numbers of people uh, or more people, I should say, arriving um, into, the, into the European Union um, across the Mediterranean. Um, the way in which social media was an organizing force for different communities of people um, to, to manage their journeys. Right, as a way of sharing information about the best routes to take, sharing information about where people could access particular services. So, like many of these things, you know, these technologies are very ambivalent, right? They, they, they are productive of many things, and they are productive, yes, of state control, of state territorialization, of processes of exclusion, but they can also be used um, for more emancipatory um, purposes or for you know, in purposes of, of group or individual agency. So I, I would say it's it's there's an ambivalence there. Great. Yeah, Thank I you. mean, I, I guess I had sort of, I, I thought of something maybe a little bit different in, in, in trying to kind of understand the question. And, um, you know, uh, it seems that we all recognize, particularly, you know, I think anybody who has access to technology, I think we all recognize the extent to which uh, these are modes of surveillance and these are modes of profit making and so on. Um, and yet, you know, there's this question of well, how come people don't seem upset about this? Why are they putting all this personal information up? Why is it that Amazon or whatever has to know every single thing about me, right? Why is it that people are kind of posting intimate pictures of themselves? And what's, what's sort of interesting is that you know, the ubiquity of, of that belief that, well, if you don't have anything to hide, you shouldn't really worry about this, right? And to me, that just sort of shows, in a sense, kind of where we've reached at a societal level that we've just sort of accepted that, well, these are the conditions within which we live. And um, we, yeah, and that we somehow accept these, right, rather than, than challenge them. So I was just sort of thinking about that when I, when I, when I heard the question. Great. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I'm going to draw us. It was okay, Helga, sorry, were you about to? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Yeah, so I'm going to draw us a little bit to perhaps coming on to, um, to the topic of Palestine, Israel in a little bit more detail, because of course, both of you work on, on uh, or, uh, you know, both of you work on this. And of course, Polly, I know that you've done quite a bit of work on this and, and now more focused on the European side of things, but have got quite a Quite a, quite a bit of work on this as well. Um, and what I wanted both of you to perhaps introduce us a little bit to, um, and both of you of course have worked to the ways in which uh, technology and various high-tech and low-tech technologies have kind of used to create barriers and more. And um, Helga, you've kind of referred to the ways in which digital communications have been used to kind of enact what you refer to as continued colonization, as well as also a reflection, if you will, of the failures of, you know, Oslo and the impacts that it's had on Palestinian society. Um, so I was wondering if you could perhaps talk a little bit about this idea or the ways, and you know, you've mentioned a little bit here with this, you know, cell phones, but maybe to expand on it a little bit in the ways in which digital communications are used in this continued colonization process. 
And um, and then Polly, for you, if I will, maybe you'll have some things to respond to with that um, question as well with Helga's point. But I also wanted you to explain this concept that you talk about in terms of uh, socio-technical devices, barriers as socio-technical devices um, that enable data capture. And I wanted you to just tell us a little bit about that concept and how it plays out in, um, in Palestine and Israel. So um, yes, so I will perhaps start again with Helga and then we'll come on to Polly. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I guess maybe first uh, 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 a a 30 second history lesson, right? Is that it, it wasn't until the Oslo Accords of the early, early mid 1990s that Palestinians were uh, permitted their own infrastructures or certainly control over infrastructures. And, and by this, I mean everything from like sanitation to sewage to radio broadcasts, TV broadcasts and so on, as well as um, telecommunications, right? Or even roads. Um, and so, but, but, but there's always a but when it comes to Israel-Palestine. Um, what was permitted for Palestinians was incredibly constrained and limited. So it was never really uh, fully permissible to kind of have a true sanitation, sanitation system or telecommunication system or anything else because it was, it's, it's, it was and continues to be sort of ultimately reliant and dependent on Israeli infrastructures, right? So that's sort of uh, maybe the first thing I would say. Um, so that there's no such thing in a way almost as a true Palestinian telecommunication system because everything has to go back through Israel and through Israeli servers, through Israeli companies, through Israeli networks and so on, right? So that's one. Um, I think the, the other thing that I tend to think about is sometimes um, is things like the, oftentimes the, the um, I guess the things that make infrastructure or the, the, the towers and the cables and, and all of that are, are often actually used as kind of the roots for territorial colonization, right? So I think of places in the West Bank where you know, the first thing you have is you have a cell tower that emerges. And, you know, I don't know, fast forward 10, 15 years later, this is now an outpost where settlers are living and there's now a road and there's electricity and there's this and that and the Palestinians have been kicked out and so on. So there's often, and it's not just cell towers, but I think you can look at all sorts of different infrastructures that kind of function in the same way. So that's one way in which I kind of see technology and in this, in, in, in my interest sort of communication technologies as this uh, as a means of continuing colonization by an, you know, both territorial and, and by other means. Um, and what's interesting is that if you kind of, and maybe a third way is that if you, if you kind of look back historically at, for example, where the telegraph lines were laid before the state of Israel ever existed, before this conflict became what it is, you know, it, it becomes kind of not surprising to see where Israel ends up existing territorially, right? So if you, you can almost sort of map where, where power becomes possible by looking at where these different infrastructures um, existed. So that's sort of how I see the connection. Thank you. So shall I jump in from that? I mean, yeah. Yes, everything, Helga. So I mean, yeah. Colonization is a, is a material process, right? I mean, it's such a material process and it's a, a repeated material process. And I think, you know, Palestine, the occupation of Palestine um, is made possible through materiality. And it's such, a, such an enigmatic example of the ways in which um, material technologies um, are able to sort of produce particular territories and particular colonial territories. And make particular you know colonial practices possible, um, but in terms of, of of my particular work on on sort of walls and fences and security barriers um, as socio technical devices, and what I mean by socio technical devices, so yes, you know security barriers, walls, fences are play a very very important role um, in the creation um, of particular territory. Um, in the production of particular forms of territory, be that in, in, in sort of making or reaffirming, consolidating um, Israel's occupation um, of particular Palestinian space um, in the context of Israel-Palestine, um, but also, um, you know, 
in other in other spaces and, and not just at the level of the state right I think it's important to sort of understand the ways in which you know the, these kinds of processes are, happen at, at much more localized levels right if we think about gated communities uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. but to sort of move beyond the territorializing work and the simple blockading work um, that walls and fences and barriers do um, and it comes from a very a very um, simple question that I had um, and, and from my own personal experiences of sort of spending, you know, time in the West Bank over a period of time when, you know, checkpoints were, for example, like Colombia checkpoint was simply just concrete blocks in the road, uh, maybe a watchtower and maybe, a, you know, a few tanks and some jeeps and some angry soldiers um, to, to what it is today, um, which is a particular <laughs> material infrastructure architecture within um, the, the, the separation wall um, and, and how that changed over time. And so this idea of sort of socio-technical devices came from, from a very simple question that I had, which was walls have gates. <laughs> they always have gates. Um, even, even sort of old med medieval city walls have gates. The concept of a siege worked with the, con you know, the idea that these, these walls are always also permeable or selectively permeable. Um, and they have to be um, to allow the movements of goods and people um, in and out of spaces. Um, so they sort of they have biopolitical functions, or they follow particular sort of biopolitical rationalities of of, of circulation and, and security. Um, and so I was then interested in okay, so what what do these these gates in these barriers, these spaces of movement of passage? um make possible what do they do what kind of work do they do um in this sense so what what work beyond blockading do walls fences barriers um do and one of those things is is data capture i they do many things but one of those things is data capture uh in the context i mean there are examples and i i, I talk about uh fallujah at one point in the way in which the fencing of fallujah during counterinsurgency operations made possible um, the early construction um, of the biometric Iraqi database um, because people gaining access or regaining access to the city uh, following uh, the US counterinsurgency efforts, re people were required to give up all of this personal biometric and biographical, importantly, and that their biographical information was linked to their biometrics, which of course is deeply problematic. Um, from a security point of view, an individual security point of view. Um, they were forced to give up this data in order to pass through um, these, these, these control points. Um, in the context of, of the West Bank and also in the context of Gaza, um, you know, the way in which checkpoints work as, as places of data capture, of course, they are sort of continuous places in which Palestinian mobility is monitored. Who is moving? When are they moving? You know, why are they moving? Um, but not only do barriers make possible data capture at checkpoints, right? And we know that that the, for the, the sort of 700 kilometers uh, of, of, the, of the separation wall in the West Bank, you know, we have many, 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 many security cameras the whole way along the stretch um, of, the, of the fence, which are able to, to monitor movement, monitor the movement of Palestinian farmers, you know, within that particular area. Um, there are also remote control sensors. So anytime anybody would touch the fence or get near the fence, you know, the Israeli military are, are able to know about their presence. So over time, you know, all of these different digital technologies, you know, make possible a, a form of surveillance that was already present, right? And very importantly, um, I sort of, I, I, you know, I want to stress that it's, it's, this is not new, right? The way in which security barriers or the way in which the checkpoints and the separation barrier work in, in relation with each other um, in the West Bank are not new. They rely on much older systems of surveillance which have been in place um, for a long, long time. And, you know, Helga has done a lot of work on this in relation to ID cards. They work with all of that existing um, uh, surveillance infrastructure and surveillance architecture um, and sort of build on it and make a sort of, you know, a create the possibility for the capturing of huge amounts um, of data about Palestinian uh, mobility across and within uh, the spaces of the West Bank that are governed by, by the barrier. 
Wow, thank you very much, Polly. I really find that really fascinating about data cap, you know, the border is kind of this space where it's capturing the data, it's doing something, like there is something happening there. It's not just there to, you know, even though that's one of its functions, it's not just there to prevent and to stop, but there is something that is going on in terms of capturing significant amounts of information and data. Um, and I wanted perhaps um, to talk, touch on two topics. Um, one, um, is because you just briefly kind of mentioned it as well, both of you, but um, perhaps this is what I can kind of draw in a little bit in, um, we've just mentioned it a little bit, the situation in, 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 in Gaza is of course a bit even more intense in terms of the data controls and surveillance and captures that has been used. And, um, you know, perhaps the question then to, to both of you, of course, is that, um, and perhaps Helga, of course, because you've done a lot of work on 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 on, um, on Gaza as well, is you know how different is the situation there as compared to the West Bank in terms of the ways in which communications and digital communications are controlled and used by the different political parties there on the ground. Um, and then I'll tie into another question in terms of um, maybe once we've had a brief look at that, Helga, and then Polly also in response to this, is what are the responses for people on the ground when they are subject to these various forms of, you know, surveillance, punctuated mobilities, data captures and the like, because we've had a question coming in from uh, Mehrbano um, Mirzai, who is one of um, an Afghan student, I believe at the Aga Khan University, who herself is reflecting on the difficulties that she has as an Afghan national passing through various borders and controls and checkpoints and, po uh, and, uh, and herself, who has, you know, traveling, you know, across 10 countries she's making reference to in, in the question. So how can she understand this problem and how can she make herself understand this you know, the ways in which her own mobility is, is controlled and punctuated and subject to these fissures. Um, so perhaps two questions then, perhaps to have a little bit of a zooming in on, on, on Gaza and the situation there, and then a broader question of how is it that people are responding to these controls? So over to, to whoever would like to start with that. I can start with the very narrow, um, kind of, you know, I mean, uh, Gaza is, to me, in certain ways, just a sort of more extreme example of what happens elsewhere, whether it's the West Bank or even uh, sort of much farther afield, right? Um, it, it, I, I sometimes also sort of think of Gaza as almost like, you know, if I were to remain pessimistic and if I think of the future, Gaza is the future that we're kind of looking at uh, in terms of different the ways in which different populations are managed and excluded and, and contained and so on. So while yes, Gaza is unique, there are many things about Gaza that, that I think are, um, I don't know how you want to think of it as, as maybe sort of warning signs, right? Uh, even though that doesn't, which is not to say that life in Gaza is, is somehow metaphorical, right? I mean, the, the, the conditions are tough. Um, so when it comes to things like um, when it comes to things like sort of digital borders that, that I think about, right, there's only one fiber optic cable that connects Gaza to the rest of the world. It, of course, goes through Israel. It's really easy for Israel to ever sort of stop any kind of communication at the same time as we see kind of, you know, on a somewhat regular basis, there's sort of constant destruction of these different infrastructures, right? So um, everything is, if you want, at the kind of, at the uh, whims of whatever Israel wants to sort of do with Gaza, right? On the other hand, Gaza is a sort of fascinating place intellectually, if you will, because yeah, it's obviously a bordered space, right? There are walls, there are uh, cameras, there's all sorts of stuff. But it's also, you know, I also sort of think of it as um, there's the Iron Dome, there are drones, there are all sorts of ways in, in, in which digital technologies are actually, well, depends where you're sitting, but are very limited from the sort of Gazan perspective, right? So you can't, you know, th there's only so much you can do with your own kind of signals. Um, 
and and at the same time it's still a kind of place for some people to actually make profit right primarily outside of gaza but even within gaza so in a sense it's it's disturbing but perhaps i don't know maybe you sort of think of it as human nature right is um whether it's hamas or even the pa in the west bank is despite containments despite limitations despite difficulties and so on um, there are still ways of profiting off of those things. There are still ways of profiting off of those surveillance mechanisms that these things make possible, right? So these can be for the benefit, not just of Israel, but also of a, an entity like Hamas or like the PA um, in the West Bank. So, um, you know, so to me, it's all sort of kind of interconnected. I mean, I don't think you can sort of necessarily think of one as separate from the other. But uh, also that, you know, as much as Gaza is contained and somehow segregated in a way, it also speaks to um, similar processes everywhere, not, not just simply in Gaza. Thank you, Olga. Holly? I jumped. This is, this is a fantastic question. And I mean, I think this really speaks to to the way in which you know borders are both yeah they are geopolitical infrastructures right they do things they carve up they separate space um they demark territory they make states possible um and at the same time they are highly individualized and embodied and 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 the individual uh is caught up within those within the border right so when when we think and we talk about um navigating borders and of course it matters who navigates borders right and it matters who has access to the particular um technologies the particular bureaucracies the particular things that make mobility possible be that passports be that visas um and who doesn't have access to those and when that access is denied uh, the types of mobility that we see um, instead, right, irregular forms of, of mobility, or I should say irregularized, right, because it is made irregular um, by particular impositions, particular ways of, of restricting mobility privileges to, to, you know, let's be honest, people from the global north. Um, but the way in which, you know, the, the, Im the imbrication of you know, the passport, the visa, particular forms of biometric control, you know, people's names, Right, what this says about people, um, the way in which you know it's almost impossible to escape that that sovereign capture that the border makes possible, um, you know, especially when it's linked to biometrics, because you know you can't you can't <laughs> you can't unless you want to you know gouge out your eyes and take off your fingerprints. It's almost impossible. I mean, then we have facial recognition. I mean, all of these things. It's, it's impossible to, to evade this capture. You know, the way that this works to reproduce, continuously reproduce populations and separate populations at the border. And when I say at the border, I mean yeah, at the borderline, you know, when you get to the to the border crossing point, but also, of course, all of the infrastructures that make that that possible, right? So population registries, you know, immigration ministries, databases, you know, all of this, all of these things. Um, the ability to 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 standardize, right? I mean, the passport is an amazing technology, an amazing invention. You know, it's it it's completely internationally standardized, and it standardizes what seven set potentially seven billion people into certain forms of information, right? That have names that can be um, transliterated in Latin script. Right, that have birth, you know, that people have a birthday, right? That can be, you know, recorded. Um, that you know, you have a photograph that can be read. Um, all of these kinds of things. Um, but what this and you know what this does, and it ties you, your your body, that photograph, to you know, to a particular state territory, whether or not you're in that territory or not. Um, and you know, through those. You know your own individual experience you know of movement and then of, of encounter with the border you know it works to reproduce you as as a, as a particular nationality be it afghan or it works to reproduce me right as as someone who's british who lives in the netherlands right um you know this happens all the time but i think it's important to recognize the way in which 
um, it's not equal, right? That reproduction is not equal for everybody. And, you know, the types of names that people have matter, right? Especially in the context of, 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 of the global war on terror, right? When I pass through a border with my name, it's very, and I, being white, it's very, very different, right? To somebody else passing through a border who you know, is racialized as Muslim or as, you know, as Afghan or Pakistani or as, you know, whatever, or as a sub-Saharan African, um, you know, these things really, really matter. Uh, and so you can carry, for example, the privileges that say a British passport, fewer privileges these days since Britain left the European Union, but you can carry the privileges which, you, you know, a British or a European passport give you, but if, you know, when you're not white, those privileges are, are, are still different, right? And you experience and you encounter the border in different ways, right? If you have a Muslim name or, you know, you, you're black or whatever, but right? you experience the border in different ways. Your belonging is always somehow conditional or is performed as conditional. Um, and, you know, you know we're, we work in that sense to sort of reproduce particular territories as sort of legitimately belonging to particular groups of people, um, in, you know, in particular ways. I mean, I could talk about this all day, so I will, <laughs> I will start. No, I think it's really fascinating because I think it's re it is really, I mean, it's always interesting to see, of course, the inequalities that are reproduced, even if you have at the simultaneous time, you've got a process of standardization taking place. And even if you do have a process of standardization, there is a different hierarchy amongst kind of what type of documents you have, uh, what color passport you have, as Helga's work has kind of looked at, if you're in area A, B or C in the Palestinian territories, you know, what these types of things have. Um, and I always find it quite fascinating also just to see, you know, of course, what the global war on terror has done to Muslim populations in Europe and in North America, and also the strategies that people enact in response. Um, and in some cases, the strategies, they really are, you know, reduced mobility in some cases, right? They can be more fearful actions where uh, time becomes racialized very much so in terms, and space becomes racialized in terms of what one does and what one doesn't. And, you know, um, from my own work on Afghan refugees in, who are living in Pakistan, you know, anytime there was a big kind of terrorist attack in the country, people will not go to the shops or will not be able to move or will not be able to be mobile. But what I also found interesting is also looking at how people respond and the sites of resistance or navigation is perhaps the correct word, right, is the ways in which they navigate this with the intent of kind of subverting these borders. And I'm, I'm quite interested just to hear a little bit about, uh, about, you know, some of these examples that you might have encountered. I always found it really interesting that for example, in the case of Afghans in Pakistan, so Pakistani ID cards are issued only after the age of 18, but Afghans who have ID cards in Pakistan who might have been living there have them at the age of five, right? So what I would always find is that young teenage Afghan boys who are often quite racialized would say, no, no, I haven't got my ID card yet. And, you know, here are my Pakistani textbooks and they would find ways of like navigating or they would dress or they would mention somebody who they would be able to navigate the checkpoint where you had the border in the city or outside of their school. So I was interested in just, you know, some anecdotal examples perhaps or, or examples that you can think of from your own kind of experiences of how it is that people try to subvert and in some cases can't subvert, right? Because the, the violence is often too, too, too gross, but perhaps some of these examples that you can think of from your own work as well. Um, I, I, I don't know, I, I somehow can't, I guess I can think of examples where, where these have been subverted, but I think you've sort of touched on them, right? So you choose not to show your ID card, right? Um, I think it's important to recognize that while sometimes that, that means that you can evade capture, it also means that you might not have access to the things that you do need, right? So if I look at um, Meher Bono's question, right, on the one hand, there's a part of me that's like, but that's great, because then that means that you're not actually fully captured, right? So, I mean, maybe different states or different systems think of you as a, as a different person, and you can perhaps use that to your advantage, as opposed to feeling like you're actually completely uh, sort of um, sort of, but I say that, and I of course recognize that it, it also means that access to things might be difficult, whether it's healthcare or movement or banking or, or whatever else, right? Um, what I find though kind of 
What I tend to sort of think about though in the realm of communications is how much, um, how much communication systems and their control can become so overwhelming and totalizing and not actually give a lot of space for maneuverability or for agency or for freedom, right? So if you can't connect to the internet because, you know, I don't know, because either you can't afford it or because the line has been cut or because you don't want to be surveyed, then you just can't connect to the internet. There's just simply no way around it, right? Um, so what are you gonna do? You're gonna use the postal service. You're gonna rely on face-to-face -face communications. You're gonna send smoke signals, right? So of course there are ways to get around it, but I think sometimes what a kind of the deepening, if I can call it that, of sort of technological systems makes evident is how difficult it actually becomes to sort of maneuver those kinds of spaces, right? Um, I'll just say, I think maybe it was sort of more in reference to something that you were saying earlier, Sanat, but yesterday I was reading this fascinating paper about all of these different technologies that are used at the checkpoints in Palestine and how, so, so you know, I, iris scans and so on. And this person is, is writing about how so many times these technologies fail, right? And it's sort of like, well, that doesn't make any sense, right? But she makes this really interesting argument of, well, but they fail precisely because that element of surprise, of, of unknowability of, am I gonna pass or am I not, is part of the system of control, right? So, so it's even when we have fully technical systems, right? Um, that's not necessarily the point of control. Control might come in, in, in different kinds of ways. So I was just sort of thinking of that as well. Um, I think I know that paper. <laughs> I think it's Alexandra's paper. Um, if she's, somewhere, she's somewhere in the Netherlands, not Amsterdam. Yeah, Alexandra Rijka. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's right. great. <laughs> she's great. She wrote a fantastic PhD. Um, yeah, she's, she's brilliant. Um, no, I mean, and I think I think it's really important to also recognize the sort of the ways in which you know, not being captured, right, by these technologies. You know, the, our rights are linked to these forms of identification. They are linked to uh, you know being able to be legible and to be recognizable by sovereign power. Um, and yes, it can be it can be a form of freedom to to sort of remain, yeah. Um, uncaptured by them, but then, you know, we still live in a sovereign state system and, you know, it does prevent people from accessing particular things. And I can remember, you know, a few years ago, we had a big, big discussion around sort of at a time when the US, were, I think it was the time of the Muslim ban, and we were like, should we just all like destroy our identity documents? And I just was like, why would you do that? That's like, why? Because like, they're a privilege. Why would you give up your privilege just because I'm, and it's just it's kind of a very because you can still get them back, right? And it's not actually going to affect your life if you sit in like Amsterdam as a white person in any possible way. You've just now made it your life a little bit harder for yourself. Um, and people are daily risking their lives, attempting to come to a space where they can access such privileges. And so, to, I mean, it was a very interesting discussion, and we, we all decided that we were not going to destroy our identity documents. So my dog has just stolen my shoe and he's now eating it. So if I seem a little bit distracted, it's because it's I'm not giving any any attention. So now it's like, I'm going to eat your shoe. <laughs> so naughty, so naughty. Um, ooh, I can throw it at George Bush or something, you know? Um, but also I wanted to, to sort of talk about the ways in which some of these things are used counterintuitively, right? Or are, I mean, so there's a very good case and it doesn't exist anymore. And it was a loophole that was closed very quickly, but I have a good friend and colleague, Anya Frank, who has worked on this. And the ways in which um, in Greece in 2015, anybody arriving irregularly was issued with a 40 day expulsion order. They were, get, they were told they had 40 days to leave Greek territory. Right? And the only way that they could leave Greek territory was onwards in their journeys through Europe, through the Balkan route. And when therefore they got to the border with Macedonia, they presented these expulsion orders and they said, but we have to leave. So you have to grant us passage or you at least have to let us in um, to Macedonia um, because we've been told we have 40 days to get out of Greece. 
right? And so for a small while, these expulsion orders actually facilitated their cross-border movement until it was sort of recognized that this was, was, was a problematic and was being used to sort of perform, cement, um, and increase mobility through the Balkan route. But, you know, that's, that's one very clear way that I can think of, of the way in which sort of particular forms of control or attempts to, to, to exclude and to expel had actually, were actually used um, for the benefits um, of people on the move. Thank you, um, Polly. I'm just very conscious of time because I know that we are actually quite close, relatively close to the end. So I do want to just remind um, the audience that if you do have any questions, then please do put them into the chat box and I'll try to weave them into the conversation as well and try to make sure that we can get to them. Um, and so I'll allow everyone online just a few minutes to think about any questions that you might want to post um, to um, Helga or to Polly. Um, and I also just wanted to perhaps because I'm because I am conscious of time and I know we haven't gotten so much to the part of the Mediterranean and the European hotspots Polly that you referred to because I think that this particular intervention that you have made when it comes down to understanding what has been taking place within Europe and on in the Greek islands and in the Mediterranean um, and with your attention to humanitarian organizations such as Medicine Sans Frontier. Um, I think that is a, a really important um, space that I want to just create a little bit for in this conversation and um, because of course in your work and your more recent work has centered on migration into Europe and humanitarian borders and hotspots, what you refer to as humanitarian borders and hotspots, these two concepts that you've developed in your work. And part of what you've done is, um, of course, referring to humanitarian agencies and the spaces through which they try to navigate to offer forms of relief, to offer forms of support to very fluid and transient and mobile communities and people themselves and you refer to these humanitarian agencies operating in these transient transient and you know makeshift conditions which for medical practitioners in particular and humanitarianists um you know who are bound by these ethics of providing care to their patients both at the time of you know diagnosis and afterwards it pre presents them with a whole host of problems so you speak about this in your work and the European kind of like migration circuits through these dimensions of humanitarian borders and then the other concept of, of, of hotspots. And perhaps I wanted you just to tell us and tell the audience a little bit about what these concepts are because they are really quite useful I've found in, in just trying to understand what has been taking place there. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think it's really important when we're discussing the humanitarian border and then the types of humanitarian border work that take place in response um, to the border is to, to understand the structural conditions in which humanitarian borders come into being. Um, and it's really on, you know, based on the idea that for a large number, for the majority of the world's population who are excluded from uh, accessing safe and legal forms of transportation through these various border technologies, visas, strict carriers liability, which present, you know, prevents people accessing airplanes, ferries, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the border, crossing the border has become, you know, a matter of life and death. And then in response to that, you have humanitarian interventions targeted at the level of saving lives. Um, but it's also then very important to understand that, you know, the saving of life in that particular instance, while necessary, right, while fundamentally important, doesn't do anything to dismantle the exclusionary, restrictive, racist, you know, foundations, practices of the border um, itself. Um, but in my work, I've been very interested in the, in, in the sort of particular, the ways in which humanitarianism and the border what I call border work, which is the way in which borders are continuously produced through everyday work, often through by non, you know, traditional border actors. So in this case, humanitarians, the way in which the, the relieving of suffering and the saving of lives at borders both changes the border, changes where it is, or the spaces and the times of the border, right, shifts the border southwards into, into international waters in, 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 in the Mediterranean, into the territorial waters of Libya currently, right, so expanding European space at sea, um, but also, um, you know, cements and sort of um, create sort of pop-up, what we could call sort of pop-up spaces um, of care at particular uh, moments when people uh, people's mobility is, is interrupted and is denied, and therefore their immobility becomes both 
a possibility for humanitarian intervention, right, creates the space and time for the provision of care, but at the same time, um, that intervention or the, the, the stoppage of people's mobility creates the very conditions and the need um, for humanitarian uh, intervention. And there are many examples of this and it, you know, it changes and it's very fluid and it, it changes over time, but there are multiple, you know, for example, places on the Balkan route or places in northern Greece, you know, where, where the interruption of people's mobility as they were as they were on the move, you know, became made both made possible um, the provision of humanitarian assistance, but of course also made necessary the provision of humanitarian assistance. And then hotspots are are areas of what the European Union calls high migratory pressure, right? So the Greek Aegean islands um, and some of the islands in the central Mediterranean, so Sicily, um, etc. Um, and hotspots are supposed to be um, sort of kind of one-stop shops um, for a whole range of services, right? So they are registration and identification centers, first and foremost, right? So they're places in which um, people on the move are captured, right? Their data is captured, it is curated, populations are literally create, you know, curated refugee populations are digitally um, rendered visible or you know digitally made um, but they are also not only registration and identification centers they are holding centers right people are not able to leave the hotspots until their asylum decision has been granted um, and therefore they then become spaces of, of humanitarian intervention but they're very you know they're they're not refugee camps in the same thing in the sort of traditional sense right the spatiality and the temporality is different um, the, the, the legality, people's um, status within those spaces is, is a lot more um, precarious, um, so to speak, because they're not necessarily immediately um, recognized as refugees. Um, but importantly, also, it's important to recognize the ways in which you know, humanitarian intervention itself um, especially targeted at vulnerable groups of people or people considered to be vulnerable actually starts to condition access to mobility, right? So in ways in which, for example, on the Greek islands, if you are considered to be in a vulnerable risk category, right, you do not have to stay on the Aegean islands while you await your asylum decision. You are allowed to move to the mainland to an apartment in Athens, right? If you are considered to have particular psychosocial trauma, right? You are granted access to asylum in ways that people who are not diagnosed with particular psychosocial trauma are not given access to, which is a, which is creates a whole complex um, set of issues for the people who are themselves, who carry those diagnoses, all right? So that vulnerability itself and humanitarian need is actually becomes a vector through which people are able to exercise mobility. And then, of course, what happens to those who are not considered vulnerable, right, and this tends to be you know, highly racialized and highly gendered and age specific, right, so young, healthy men are not considered to be vulnerable, right, unless they're able to present sort of overwhelming, compelling evidence that they have been the victims of torture, or that they have particular psychosocial needs, which, of course, you know, um, is asking them to, to you know, bear their souls effectively to the border regime um, and, you know, in, in recognition of, of, of their right to, to life and to have a future. Um, I could talk about this for a lot longer, but I, I'll, I'll probably stop there. But I think it, it's important to sort of recognize the, the imbrication of mobility um, and the sort of the provision of humanitarian assistance and the way in which it not only changes the border, but it also changes the ability for humanitarians to do their jobs. It's much more restrictive, it's much more limited in scope and time um, and makes, for example, medical diagnosis very difficult um, if people are on the move. And I think that's really interesting because of course, when I'm, when, you know, in pre-2000 scholarship on refugee camps in terms of space and intervention by humanitarian organizations or international institutions or you know, NGOs and, and, and the like, the predictability is somewhat there in terms of space and access to you know, patients and persons whom you, know, you, you may need to get access to. And I think, I mean, you, you, you touched on it a little bit here because of course what seemed this, this notion of precarity that seems to define almost the condition of 
uh, refugees who are based in these locations in Europe. Um, and is that, I mean, is it a stretch to say, or is it, you know, is it something that is, you know, a clear approach that is being taken by various governments within the European Union? So answer yes. <laughs> I mean, yes. Uh, the, the desire to, to not create pull factors um, is incredibly strong. Um, and I mean, in my work, you know, especially in the work on hotspots, you know, I ask a very simple, uh, two very simple questions, right? What, it, what, oh God, now he's playing with his chicken toy. Well, at least it's not my shoe. What, what is humanitarianism? And who is it for, right? And I, you know, and I discuss humanitarianism as a security technology of the state, as a way for liberal order to reproduce itself, to secure itself. And therefore, who is it for? Is it for the supposedly humanitarian subjects, right? The precarious life, the vulnerable life, or is it also actually about Europe maintaining and protecting its own liberal order? And you know, what does it enable, what type of Europe does it enable the reproduction of, right? And that is a Europe which, you know, will cling to these ideals of humanitarianism, right? As a sort of a particular form of liberal order um, while you know, maintaining a particular kind of white innocence around, you know, the complicity of Europe, both, you know, in the violence and, and, and the suffering that people are, are, you know, moving and migrating from, um, but also from the, the violence that's, that's within Europe, right? And the particular type of, of European idea that we're reproducing when we engage um, in these activities. So, I mean, I would say that, yes, we, the way in which, uh, you know, these spaces are created as being as unattractive as possible, it's absolutely by design, right? To, to not, you know, to not create pull factor and to you know to to enforce you know in practice this idea that if you are a refugee you know you should claim asylum in the first country you go to right and that should be outside of the global north um, and it should not be in the global north which of course is completely you know against you know what is allowed within international humanitarian law and, and, and refugee law thank you so much um thank you so much polly and um yeah, thank you very much to the to the questions that are also coming in from the audience. I'm just perhaps going to, uh, just because I'm conscious of, of time, I'm going to perhaps ask the panelists just to have a very quick response to one of the questions that have come through from uh, and the, you know from our audience, which um, is a bit specific to India, the Aadhaar cards, the ID cards that have been referred to in India, which are used as uh, and, and referred to by Kelsey Utne in our audience as a tool of population surveillance and as a means of dispossessions of marginalized populations. So this is the Aadhaar card that was introduced, started to be rolled out in 2011 and in 2013, and has then since then picked up pace. And of course, you know, we are next, uh, and our next session on October the 25th, we are having a context of we're having Kashmir and Palestine in conversation and looking at militarized zones of occupation and how they share similarities and differences in the forms of kind of technological control that are being exerted um, on Kashmiri and Palestinian populations. And the Aadhaar card is one of the tools, um, but also not because there are whole multiple other tools that are used um, on, on Kashmiri populations. Uh, for control, but I guess the principle of technology is being used as a as a means of surveillance, but also of dispossession. Perhaps you can briefly just briefly just end, perhaps with your summations or of, of some of what you've shared with this. Just giving a couple of thoughts on these things. Yeah, perhaps I'll go first to Helga. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I I, I guess. But specifically about those cars, I think that they are, um, from what I understand, they're voluntary, right? So they're not, and they're not yet necessarily kind of connected to um, specific uh, information. But nonetheless, I think they are kind of very global examples of, of how ID cards do function, right? And precisely as you're saying, of uh, they are means of population surveillance, they are means of dispossession, but also, I mean, it has to be said, they are often means of uh, access, right, to, to different things. So, you know, they, and, and I don't, and in that sense, they're not necessarily unique, right? They, these things exist everywhere, and it's just a, a question of 
to what other sorts of sets of data or information are they connected and are they required or are they not and so on, right? So you do find that um, the, uh, I don't know, the more stringent the regime within which these cards exist, right? The more totalizing that kind of surveillance uh, or, or the, it, that data is, right? So whether it's South, um, South African apartheid, whether it's Israel-Palestine, whether it is, um, you know, sort of all these different kinds of examples. Um, but these are also questions that are in, that increasingly exist everywhere else. So they're not just simply about strict regimes, but, but everywhere. Um, I think it also just sort of points to this, this belief, I guess, at large that, you know, digitization or technification or so on becomes a sort of objective way of including and excluding people. And it clearly is not. And I think ID cards sort of show in a very clear way how that exclusion and bias actually works. Thank you, Helga. I mean, I think these, the, yeah, I mean, this example is also a really good example of the way in which technologies travel and techniques of governance travel across space. And I mean, and, and maybe have always been decentered, right? We also like to often, I think, especially people within the global north or Europe, especially, and especially European critical security scholars, um, like to think of sort of, you know, Europe as, as the space in which these technologies are, are sort of fostered and created, and then they filter out right out, you know, they radiate outwards and sort of, put, you know, traditionally kind of colonial relations of domination. Um, but I think actually, I think the sort of longer histories of, of population control and surveillance within, within South Asia, for example, would show that that's not necessarily the case, right? That the colonial space is, is the laboratory um, and is the space in which actually many things then move back to the, to the metropole, if we can still talk about the world in those particular contexts. But I think the Indian case is also fascinating for the way in which there are, you know, let's talk, you know, the, the relationships, for example, between the Israeli security state, um, Israeli security um, industry, right, and its attempts to be seen as a global world leader um, in these types of forms of sort of counterinsurgent uh, population control, right, and the, the, really, you know, the very close relationships they have um, increasingly um, with India. Um, in this regard, um, but also, I mean, on on just on the level of sort of population control and surveillance and and, and ID cards. I mean, I'm thinking here of like Yael Berda's work, right? And she's doing a lot of work on on the on the relationships between um, both um, surveillance and, and and identification within within Israel Palestine um, and also within um, the South Asian Indian context. Um, so you know, I think that this is a great example of the ways in which um, yeah, these these. I, you know, these forms of, of domination, forms of governance um, travel, but not necessarily in, in, in unidirectional ways that we perhaps still think of in sort of, you know, if we're still thinking in a kind of Eurocentric uh, way. Thank you so much to both of you, um, you know, for, for sharing your time and for sharing your thoughts. I'm really sad that the time is over, but I'm very, very grateful to both of you for having shared such, you know, such um, such brilliant thoughts, and there's much that I think many of us will have learned from, and it's been an absolute pleasure to have been a part of this conversation. So thank you both for for joining us, and um, just a note to to the audience: we also got some thanks from the audience as well, particularly about you know managing working from home, Polly. So um, I think thank you, Jennifer Redmond, for for that comment as well. So yes, working from home has its own challenges. Yes, thank How you, you, Jennifer. <laughs> Helga, your dogs were pretty well behaved, isn't it? And, and he's yes. been snoring, but very lightly, so maybe <laughs> you haven't heard it. Yeah, well, I we didn't catch that, and my three-year-old is hasn't managed to break door, break, break down the door, so it's great. Um, but thank you very much, and um, for the audience and for for the panelists, for anyone who's interested, those um, we are on October the twenty-fifth, which is a Monday at a different time. Oh, hello. <laughs> we can all say, "Oh, beautiful." Um, and I hope, um, what's, um, Polly, what is your, what is uh, the name of your? Bilbo. Sorry? Bilbo. Okay. Like, so the, hope... like the Hobbit. Bilbo like the Doggins. Hobbit. So I hope Bilbo will join us. Got big furry feet. <laughs> <laughs>
Mr. Bilbo and his fairy feet, I hope they will join us on October the 25th for our next panel, um, which will be looking at Kashmir and Palestine in conversation. So looking at technologies of surveillance and looking at how actually in a bit more depth and detail, both of these, uh, the close alliance in many ways between the Israeli military and also the Indian military of kind of enacting um, uh, militarized zones of control and occupation and the implications of course on, on everyday life for ordinary people. That will be with uh, Taufik Haddad, who's at the Council of Research in the British Levant. Um, Yara um, Hawari, who's based at Al um, Sh uh, Shabaka in Jerusalem, um, Mohammed Janaid, who's based in Massachusetts, and Atar Zia, who's based in, in the University of Colour Colorado, and Mehrush Tak, who is based at um, in London at the Royal Veterinary College. So that will be on Monday, the 25th of October at 1 to 2.30 p.m. UK time, so slightly earlier time to be more accessible to the different time zones that we have. But it's a huge honor for us to have had both of you here today. The video will be uploaded at some point this week online for those who are interested and want to replay it and see Bilbo again and hear from Helga's thoughts and Polly's thoughts as well on the border. But thank you so much. And thank you to the audience as well for your patience as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for such great questions as well. Yeah, from the audience. Yeah, great, great question. So thank you all. And I guess we can end our session and I will follow up with an email to to the panelists as well after this so thank you very much and bye-bye <laughs>